Okay, turn it. So wherever you want to stand, it's fine. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for uh, coming this afternoon. Uh, and welcome to the ISU Faculty and Staff Presidential Candidate Open Forum. My name is Gene Warren. Uh, I am a Faculty Senate uh, Co-Chair, and I'm also uh, a member of the ISU Presidential uh, Search Committee. The committee chair asked that I facilitate this forum. Uh, so if you have any comments about the candidates, please go to the Presidential Search uh, site there on the ISU webpage. Uh, that way that information will get directly to the search committee and the State Board of Education. We appreciate the time that our candidate has taken to uh, visit with us today. He's got a busy schedule. Uh, we only have uh, only 45 minutes to visit with him, which is not enough. <laughs> uh, but that's what we've been given uh, by, you know, the HR folks. Uh, but it's just a very tight schedule. Um, so with that information, uh, since we only have the 45 minutes, we really need to set a few ground rules, per se, about this forum uh, to give everybody a chance to ask a question. And first thing is, is that I'd like to have you limit your questions to one minute or less and ask only one question. That'll give everybody a chance, hopefully, to have a chance to, uh, to ask some, uh, some kind of a question. We also ask our candidate to, to be brief uh, and stay on topic when answering those questions. If there is time near the end of the forum, I will invite uh, some additional questions, but we really need to uh, end on time because the candidate has, a, has another appointment or next engagement uh, right at uh, 5.15. So it's, it's going to be tight. Actually, 5 o'clock, I believe. So um, there's mics on both sides. There's one over here, one over here. In order for the mic to really work, you need to push the on button on the top, so be careful with that. So with that... Um, this is uh, Mr. Kevin Satterley. Kevin was named a vice president at Boise State University in 2010 and promoted to chief operating officer in 2015. Kevin's leadership at the university focuses on a student-centric mission with three themes, empathy for the needs of the students, attention to detail, and demonstrating quality through work product. Because of his unique relationships and historical knowledge, Kevin also serves as a special counsel to the president on issues related to state board of education, legislative and policy issues, athletic department issues, and institutional compliance. Um, he, uh, he previously served on a, ver on a variety of positions at Boise State University dating back to 2001. Prior to that, uh, Kevin was the de Deputy uh, Attorney General uh, in the Idaho 
uh, attorney general's office for six years. While there, he was he was lead counsel for the State Board of Education, State Board of Pharmacy, State Board of Nursing, and the State Liquor Dispensary. Kevin received his bachelor's degree in political science from Boise State University and was named a top 10 scholar of the university. He received his law degree from the University of Idaho. Please welcome Ke Mr. Kevin Satterley. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I was asked in getting ready for this forum to prepare a 10 to 15 minute speech about my vision and philosophy and why I wanted this position. But I think Gene wisely advised me I should cut that down significantly to give more time for your questions. So I will do just that. But if I could have just a couple of minutes at the beginning, I'll go through the short version of my speech. I'll just hit on some of the philosophical points. I think the short version of it starts like this. Uh, my favorite day to come to work every year is the first day of fall classes. And the reason is because on the first day of fall classes, we go from being the sleepy summer campus to the campus that is suddenly filled with the energy of thousands of our students returning to campus or coming to campus for the first time. And I tell my staff and I tell my department heads constantly why that's my favorite day. That's my favorite day because it reminds us all why we're here. We are here to deliver education to those students. They are here because for some of them, this is their lifelong dream. They've made it into the university. They're going to college. Some of them are here because they're here for mid-career job retraining so that they can feed their families. Some are here to take one class and some are here because that's what their parents expected of them. But regardless, they are here to try to better their lives and get an education. And the only reason any one of us has a job, the only reason any one of us has a job is to deliver education to those students. It doesn't matter if you're a landscaper or a faculty member, or you're a researcher or a financial aid counselor, or you're an architect or you're an administrative assistant, everybody on this campus owes their job to meeting the mission of delivering education to our students. I've spent 20 years in the Idaho higher education system, and I really believe that I have spent my 20 years with one mission, and that is my job is to support the faculty. The faculty are out there every day delivering education to our students. They're out there researching new knowledge and new things to teach to our students and new ways of doing things. And my job is to make it easier for them to do that. That's our mission. My job is to remove the barriers that the faculty have to getting that knowledge out to the students. Right? I'm there so that we can have a good classroom environment, so we can have a safe learning environment. I'm there so that we can take programs and get them approved by the State Board of Education so we can start offering them. I'm there so we can take ideas and turn those into programs that we can take to the State Board of Education. I'm there to find funding for those programs so that we can get them delivered to our students. That's my entire job. Whether I'm president of the university or whether I'm chief operating officer where I am now or whatever my role is, it's about supporting the faculty in delivery of education to our students. And what I've discovered about that particular mission is that mission requires passion. You have to have a passion for that job. And there's another thing that I've learned. In higher education leadership, you can't fake passion. You either do or you do not have a passion for our mission. I do. I'll come here every day every day with a passion for what we do, with a philosophy that that's our mission. I can't promise to be perfect at all of it, but I will come here and I will come here every day with the right attitude and the right outlook to move forward on our mission. And a quick analogy. I promise, Jeannie, it'll be short. We'll get to the questions. My son went to college and he rode on the crew team for his university. And collegiate rowing is often described by many as the ultimate team sport. And it's called the ultimate team sport because it requires everybody in the boat to be working in unison towards the shared direction in order for them to be successful. If any one person in the boat isn't working towards that shared vision, the entire boat fails. 
not just the person who isn't doing it, but the entire boat fails if everybody isn't working in unison towards a shared vision. When they are working together, they call it when the boat gets into its swing. That's what they call it. They say you can physically feel it. You can feel the boat change in the boat when they're all working together. And one of the things they've discovered, and they always tell you if you talk to a rower, is when they're in that swing, they lose, they, they stop caring about what other boats are doing because they're focused on what they're doing and what they're doing well. I honestly believe that Idaho State University has fantastic potential, untapped potential, to do some fantastic things. And when you find your swing, you're going to be unstoppable. And when you do, and when you're focusing on the things you want to accomplish, and when you're playing to your strengths and you're building your relationships, that's when you'll accomplish them and you'll be unstoppable. I can't promise a lot, but I can promise two things. I promise that I will come here with two concepts. And the others, I won't, because I don't want to come with preconceived notions, but I'll come with two concepts. One, we're going to build relationships, starting with our relationship with the faculty. The institution's relationship with the faculty is critical, right? We hire all of these smart people from all over across the nation to come in to teach to our students. I sure hope that we will take those viewpoints into account when we make decisions for the institution going forward. Why would we trust all of our faculty to teach our students and not learn from them ourselves collectively? We will build relationships with the faculty, with our students, with our staff, with our community, with our business and industry leaders who can help us, who can tell us this is what we need out in the community this is what we need your graduates to look like, how they need to be prepared so that we can give them jobs so they can have meaningful employment post-graduation. Build those relationships in the community and then bring them back to the faculty and say, here's what business and industry say they need. What can we build? You're the faculty. Come up with the idea and then let's run with it. Let's see if we can build that and produce the types of graduates that our society needs. I will come here to build relationships. Second, I will come here to play to our strengths. You have lots of strengths at Idaho State University. And if you ask anybody statewide, what everybody knows in the system is that Idaho State University is the leadership in the health sciences. You are. You've got that. It's fantastic. We're going to run with that. We're going to use that. But last year, this institution gave out 1,400 undergraduate certificates and degrees not in the health sciences. You have plenty of strengths. Your accounting program's growth is 70% over five years. Your master's in accounting is only six years old, and that's one of your top degree programs. You've doubled your uh, graduates in biology, 70% increase in your electrical engineering over five years. You have lots of strengths. We're going to find them, and we're going to play to them. Those are the two things I'll promise. Quickly, about me. I was born in a small timber town of 1,500 people in the mountains of North Idaho. I'm a fourth generation native Idahoan. And maybe most importantly, I'm a first generation college student. And I married a first generation college student. No one has to convince me the value of getting an education. I've lived it. I know what it's worth. I know what you can accomplish when you give somebody a chance with an education. I believe passionately in that mission. And the rest of my speech is better, but it's also longer, so I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, we'll go ahead and open up for questions. Uh, we have two mics. Go ahead and step up. Just remember our ground rules. That'd be great. Thank you. Right on the very top, top, right there. Good. Am I good? Yep. All right. Welcome to Pocatello, Mr. Satter Satterley. Uh, Kevin, uh, I'm Dave Delahaddy, professor of biology. I rode crew at the University of Minnesota in the late 1970s. I can tell you that the ISU boat is not set, the language we use then rather than say, uh, swing, swing. I'll also tell you the boat is leaking. So, uh, I have a specific question for you. 
At American public universities, is faculty service-related speech protected by the First Amendment? Yes. Thank you. Is there enough time, Gene? You bet. Go ahead. Faster? All right. Absolutely. Here's the question Thank that's you. running around campus. Here's the question. Uh, you, you're, you don't have it. Do you want a longer answer? Or do you just, I mean, it is. We all know that. Right? No, we don't all know it, but we know it within the Ninth Circuit. Uh, so yes is correct, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, uh, something that's running around campus is that your experience isn't fundamentally uh, academic. Uh, you haven't mentored graduate students to completion in PhDs. You don't have a terminal degree in a scholarly field. Can you address your qualifications as an academician for being president? And I'm going to sit down and just let you answer that. Sure. Thank you, Gene. You're good. Can everybody hear on the microphone? You want to use the podium? Go ahead. I'm not nearly as dynamic at the podium. Um, <laughs> I feel constrained, but okay. Um, I have a Juris Doctorate, which is a terminal degree in my field. It is not a PhD, but I won't apologize for having a Juris Doctorate. I have not mentored graduate students through completion. If you ask me why I'm qualified to be president, I am not going to tell you about my educational background, and I'm not going to tell you about my academic credentials. I'm not gonna tell you which offices I have overseen, uh, which departments report to me or how much budget I've controlled. I'm going to tell you this. I'm qualified because every day I'm going to come to this campus with a passion and with a mission-driven approach to what we do. And I believe in teaching, and I believe in the value of education, and that our mission is to educate. And a quick, just longer story, if Gina will let me. If you look at my resume, I will never claim to have the classroom experience of any of you, ever. You'd know I was wrong the moment I walked in here. One thing you'll learn about me is I'm incredibly honest. I'm not going to claim that. But for a short period of time, about seven years, I taught as an adjunct. So here's my story. I taught as an adjunct. I probably taught a total accumulated credit load that was maybe two years worth, three years worth of full-time teaching. But I didn't have service responsibilities research. I was just teaching as an adjunct. I'm teaching my class one day, and it's the entry-level class. And there's a student who's been in this class the whole semester. She was fantastic. She, the class was introduction to the legal system. Whenever she wrote her answers, they were eloquent. They were thoughtful. She thought like an attorney, like a well-trained attorney. She thought like a lawyer. She wrote like one. She analyzed things like a lawyer. So when the class was over on the last day of class, I said to her, I said, Nicole, have you ever thought about being a lawyer? She says, oh, I don't know, and hemmed and hawed a bit. And I said, no, really, you should, and here's why. And I told her what I thought about her thought processes and about how she wrote. She leaves class. Two years later, I'm teaching the upper division class. And first day of class, in walks Nicole as one of my students. Class finishes. She comes up after class. I'm like, oh, Nicole, good to see you. She said, oh, thanks. I said, how are you doing? We chatted, and I said, you know, what are you doing? We talked a little bit, and I said, do you... Remember that visit we had a couple of years ago? Have you ever thought about going to law school? And she looked at me and she said, she said, oh, Professor Satterley. She called me that. I didn't deserve the title, but it was nice for her to call me that. She said, oh, Professor Satterley. She said, I have thought more about that one comment. That comment meant more to me than anything any professor has ever said to me. And it made me think that maybe I can do some of the things that I didn't think I could do before. I got done with that night of class, and I was beaming. I was on cloud nine. I went home. I told my wife this story. I had this impact on this young lady's life. I'm just this adjunct guy teaching. And it was fantastic. It just meant a lot to me. The next morning, I come into work. We're sitting around the president's office, and I'm telling this story. And in the group of people I'm telling this story to is the provost. The provost is sitting there. His hands are folded in front of him. He smiles at me as I finish the story. And he just nods. That was it. And it clicked with me. I'm telling this one story about this one thing that happened to me, and I'm on cloud nine about it. And it's probably happened to him dozens or hundreds of times in his career. And that's why you do it. That's why you do it. I don't do that for a living, but I appreciate that you do it. It happened to me once, and I'm hooked on it. It's fantastic. I appreciate it. And I value it. Yeah, Mark. Uh, 
again, Kevin, we're glad you're here, and thanks for taking the time to be here. Uh, one question I have is supporting faculty, supporting students, there has to be sources of revenue that we have to go, we have to increase here at Idaho State University. We've not done any bonding in the last 12 or 13 years, and we've not had a comprehensive campaign. So talk a little bit about those means with which we can bring in revenue to accomplish a vision, um, both in terms of the campus and infrastructure and uh, um, experience around fundraising and a capital campaign. Sure. Thanks, Mark. I've known Mark for a long time. Um, so the president of the university is the university's primary fundraiser. Every president has to understand that that being the primary fundraiser. It is the job of the president to make those relationships that I talked about, to go out and get people excited about what we are doing, to get those who we hope and want to give to the university, to donate their money, their support, their influence. They do that when they have a relationship with the university that they find to be valuable to them. Right? Every person's inner relationship, interface with the university is a little bit different. And the president's role is to go out and make people excited about what we're doing so that they will feel good about giving to us. So the president's role is that primary fundraiser role. Um, I'll do a couple quick stories. Um, three weeks ago, I was sitting down with um, the head of one of the big alcohol distribu distributing companies in the Treasure Valley. And my job was to make an ask. And the ask was around... Um, what we're doing on our campus towards alcohol education, alcohol knowledge, and uh, treatment programs that are on our campus. My job was to make what we're doing um, something that that person could get excited about so that we could make the ask. I've done that. I've made the ask. We had someone who came to us uh, about six months ago. They had a piece of property located near the university, not on, not in our master plan, but near, and they were thinking about donating it to us. So he called, asked me about it, and I said, well, come on in and we'll talk. And then in the meantime, I had our campus planners put together what would we do with that piece of property if we had it. And since it wasn't on campus, we created sort of a, a gateway, an entry to the campus to show how that property could interface with the campus. And when the donor came in, that's what I pitched. I was, here's what we could do, this is what we could do. The donor came in and called me because he was thinking about donating property to the university, and he left excited about donating the property. That's the job of a president. I've done that. Um, I haven't done it as, as much as some, but I have done it, and I understand that job bonding capacity, different question. Um, if I was giving you my third party assessment, looking at your financials, you you could probably be accurately described as being under bonded. Um, this will be a bad analogy. You'll all hopefully forgive me for it, but it's like someone who has really good credit, but they have such good credit that they never utilize it. And when you don't utilize it, you actually lose your credit worthiness. So at some point, there is a healthy amount of debt. And I think an objective view of your campus would say you're underutilized that. But do not go out and get into bond debt for the sake of doing a project. Go out and get into bond debt when you have a master plan, both a physical master plan and a strategic plan. Don't go build a building for the sake of the building. Build it if it's going to accomplish some of your goals. Build it if it's going to get you down the road on the student experience, on your student recruitment issues, on your faculty needs issue, issues, whether it's research or other space. So once you know what those strategic needs are, match up the types of facilities you need and that's what you work on. And it might not be a new facility. It might be correcting some of your infrastructural problems or remodels or updates, but that's how you utilize that capacity, but it's all about strategically using it. So, How about that? Good afternoon. My name is Sandy Shropshire. I'm a faculty member with the library here. I've spent the last 30 years in higher education in Idaho. And I want to thank you for coming to talk with us. I want to thank the state board for giving us this opportunity. Um, you described things you'd like to do 
if you were to arrive here as our president. What I'd like to know, I have a two-part question. And the, first, and the, the premise is this, what, what do you judge to be the most compelling obstacle in your way at the state level and at the institutional level for ISU? Is, those are the two parts, state and institution? State and, state and local. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, at the state level answer is easier. Um, so I've been working in that higher education system for 20 years at the state board level, at the institutional level. Um, I have, I think that our biggest challenge at the state level is funding. Um, hands down, that is the biggest challenge facing Idaho State, but all of the institutions in Idaho is the commitment to funding. You know, um, so that has to be challenge number one uh, at the state level. If there's a second challenge at the state level, it is that one of the things uh, one of the things about the legislature is the legislature funds ideas and initiatives when they can see how they will benefit the citizenry which means you have to every one of the institutions has to be telling its story and the story can't be just oh we're doing great or we're doing great things it has to be how we are impacting the citizenry and their constituents at the legislature. So, so much of it is about how the, the institutions present themselves, how they present to the legislature about what they're doing that positively impacts the workforce, positively impacts the economic development, et cetera. So that I think is the, the biggest, um, the second biggest thing that sometimes holds the institutions back is the way they tell their story in the state house locally. What do I see as your biggest challenges locally? It's hard to say in one sense. I'm not here. You're here. I haven't been. I've watched from across the state, and I can tell you what it looks like from there. And what it looks like from there is there's a basic premise that I truly believe in, which is that concept. I probably won't word it right, but it's there's no such thing as a great city without a great university, and no such thing as a great university unless it's in a great city. What makes universities really successful is oftentimes how it relates to its community and how it is interrelated and viewed as an integral part of the entire community, not just the city, but the region. And building those connections, again, I'm back to relationships, building those relationships with the community, it seems like from across the state looking over, that's one of the challenges. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Satterley. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm Alan France, College of Education. You are likely aware that ISU has been on the AAUP's sanction list for infringement of governance standards since May of 2011. Uh, would you please comment on whether this situation concerns you? Second, if not, why not? And third, if it is a concern for you, what would be your approach to rectifying the problems so that the AAUP can remove the sanction. Thank you. Thank you. And again, Kevin is totally fine. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. Um, the answer to your question is yes, which is good because then I can skip the middle question. Yes, it is a problem. And, and it's not a problem because you are sanctioned by the AAUP, right? That's not the problem. The problem is, is that you don't have a good working relationship, and that's what appears to be causing the problem. Uh, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that's not what's going on, but from the outside looking in, here's what I know for certain. A university is only successful when all the parts of it are working together towards a shared mission, towards a shared goal. And... I think that it feels like part of the problem with why the, you have the AAUP problem is because there is a lack of that working relationship, a last of, lack of that trusting relationship. So the key is build the relationships to work on it. And I'll give you one example, and hopefully it's illustrative. 
I think we probably all remember the 2009-2010 timeframe at the start of the Great Recession when every one of the campuses was told we have to come up with a furlough plan to furlough our employees, including faculty, right? On our campus, the president of the university put me in as the primary liaison to, liaison to work with our faculty senate to come up with our furlough plan. I'm the one that worked on that with um, our faculty senate president and our faculty senate. We worked together, oftentimes in contention, oftentimes uh, differing philosophies on where we were going to go, but we worked together. No one wanted to do it. No one wanted this plan to move forward, but we all had to. So we worked through it, and one of the ways we worked through it was when we decided mutually, we're talking about a furlough plan but that we have to resolve, but let's not just resolve that. Let's look broader at what this does to our relationship and how we can mitigate those problems. So what we did at the same time we were talking about furloughs was we started talking about what should we do about dependent tuition rates. So uh, faculty and staff members and their dependents, and can the dependents get a tuition break? We started talking about more access for our employees to things like our child care centers and other things on campus at differing rates so we could mitigate the impact that was coming with furloughs. And we worked together, and one of my proudest professional achievements is the day that we presented our plan to the State Board of Education because the President of the Faculty Senate and I sat side by side and jointly presented our plan that neither of us wanted, but we jointly presented it because we worked on it together in good faith. I watched as our sister institutions across the state struggled mightily during that time. At the end of the day, you have to build trusting, collaborative relationships. I really think if you address that, you will get to the root of the problem with the AAUP. Kevin, uh, my name is Guillermo. I'm from the First Year Transition Program, and I had a question for you. As far as maybe based on your leadership recently, maybe in the last five years, what has been your biggest contribution to students of color? That's a great question. Thank you for it. Because um, my personal journey with regard to diversity and inclusion is, has been very personal. Because had you asked me that same question 15 years ago, here would have been my answer. 15 years ago, I would have said, I have a track record of diversity and inclusion. Look at the people that I've hired. Look at the people that I've promoted. I have a track record. I'm good. 15 years ago, that would have been my answer. After 15 years of leadership and realizing the cultural positives that come uh, with diversity and inclusion, I realized that back then I didn't know that. I didn't know what I was doing. It, I have come to the basic conclusion that it's as simple as this. Increased diversity and increased inclusiveness is just the right thing to do. It's good for us. It's good for all of us when we have diverse ideas and diverse viewpoints and you become more sensitive to other cultural cultural situations. When we hired, when I hired our um, affirmative action officer uh, a little over a year ago, we were having a, a conversation when I hired her and she said, what's your vision for where we want to take this office? And I said, Gayla, if you come in here and you write the perfect affirmative action plan that is absolutely perfect and you certify every one of our hiring pools, we will have failed because that's compliance for the sake of checking off the box. What I want is an affirmative action program that is reaching out to all of the departments and all parts of the campus and training on why diversity is good for us, why inclusiveness is good for us that we all are better when that happens, not because we have to comply, but because it makes us better. So one of the things between then and now, she is all over campus on those types of training programs and it's working. I'm uh, Bill Bryden and I certainly appreciate listening to your comments. You've answered uh, many of the questions that I have. I too rode crew uh, in St. Louis, and the Mississippi is not a very pleasant place to fall in. Uh, and I'm also a, a first generation uh, college graduate. Uh, anyway, uh, over the last five, six years, 
Idaho State has suffered a rather significant loss of student body, mm -hmm. and this is still ongoing. Uh, and it mainly is coming from Bannock, Bonneville, and Bingham counties. Would you uh, tell us what your plans are to rectify this? Yes, thanks. Um, and just so we're clear, I didn't row crew. I can take no credit. My son did. And he said the several times he fell on the Willamette River while doing that wasn't very pleasant either. Um, your enrollment numbers are troubling. So what does it take to rectify that? You have to make a commitment to your recruitment efforts, but recruitment efforts are not successful until you deal with your retention issue, right? You can recruit all the students you want, but if you're not retaining them and moving them through the pipeline, you're not doing yourself any good. Your retention numbers require work as well. So the first thing I think you would do is say, we need to go on a multi-year effort to deal with our retention issues. Now, how you deal with those retention issues differs depending on what your problems are. But in general, you got to look at your math pathways. You got to look at your English pathways. You have to look at your core. Uh, you have to look at academic advising across the institution. You have to look at your degree completion requirements at the departmental level and make sure they're working together. But you have to make a commitment to something like a freshman success task force. And you got to realize that's going to be a seven to 10 year project. But you got to make that commitment at the beginning so that at the same time, then you can start dealing with your recruitment issues. To deal with your recruitment issues, there's a lot of things you have to do. You have to know what your market is. What is the market where we are truly successful when we are doing recruiting? What types of students are we successful with and what types are we not? You have to know what your recruitment philosophy is going to be. You have to know you definitely have to know what your lost admit data looks like, right? Who are the students that we admit to the university, but they don't show up, but they do go somewhere else? If you don't know what your lost admit data is and why they're going somewhere else and where they go, it's hard to figure out how you make sure you increase your yield um, on the programs you are doing. And then you have to build that recruitment philosophy and personalize that experience. Those students, and most of the time, more importantly, their parents, have to know that this is a personal experience, which is, which gets to the final piece to what I think is one of the keys to recruitment, and it's what's the role of the faculty. Now, I know faculty are busy. I know you have teaching responsibilities, you have research, you have service responsibilities, but I have seen firsthand so many times how a faculty member's presence at a recruitment event changes everything. Students wanna know that their faculty are invested and want them to go to school there, but more importantly, parents. Parents wanna know that faculty want their children to come be the adult students there. So you really have to have a philosophical conversation about what is the faculty role. Faculty need to be invested in bringing more students to the campus. And that has to be a conversation that everyone's willing to engage in. But again, you gotta start with retention. Retention numbers and statistics are a huge point for parents out there. They watch those. You have to work on that to get them through the pipeline and then work on your recruitment issues. I'm Todd Johnson, director of the Veteran Student Services Center. My question is, why Idaho State University? Why Idaho State University? I see so much untapped potential on this campus and in this region of the state. That's why I want to come here. The flip side of that question is, Kevin, why do you want to leave Boise State? My answer, I don't. I don't want to leave Boise State. I don't have a bunch of presidential applications out there. I'm not applying all over the West. I have one, and it's here. I see so much untapped potential on this campus, and if you, we, can work together, set a shared vision for how we're gonna capitalize on that potential, I'm not kidding. Idaho State University has the opportunity to be unstoppable in this region. That's why I'm applying for the job. We have time for one more. <laughs> Hi there. Sorry, a little shorter. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. 
So I didn't row crew, but I do work on water quality. Um, so hopefully it's less painful to fall in. Um, with that in mind, I, I, was, I was curious um, if you could comment on your vision for the role of research at ISU. Thank you so much for your introductory comment. That was a fantastic callback to the entire 45 minutes of conversation. Uh, the role of research. Research is critical to the life of a public research university, but not in general. I don't want to offend anyone, but I'm hoping we can be honest. Your research revenues and your research expenditures over the last eight years are trending in the wrong direction. That needs to turn in a, new, a different direction. Right? Research is too valuable to our students, to the student experience, to their uh, opportunity, whether as undergraduate or graduate students, to be involved in it. The creation of new knowledge is why we're here. How research and using research expenditures to um, kickstart other operations at the university and fund other operations and bring uh, prestige, to bring new knowledge, to bring all of those things together, research is really critical. Your relationship with the lab, um, your proximity to the lab is critical. And it's not just the lab, but it's with all of your local employers. The key that we have to do is we have to figure out what's that barrier? What is the barrier right now? Are, do we have the wrong policies in place? Are we not incentivizing the right um, faculty activity? Are we not allowing the right faculty activity? Do we have some roadblocks in place that are keeping the faculty from that productive research? Whatever those issues are, we have to identify them and work on a common solution because research research benefits everybody in the room and it benefits our students the most. So I will come with a commitment to figure out why those numbers are going in that direction. I don't know why. I hope you're not looking to me for the answer to why because I don't know, but I'd be willing to bet you do. And if you do and you have my commitment to work on it, and we can work together, I know it can be solved. And you want to know why I know it can be solved? Look at Boise State's research numbers of 12 and 15 years ago and look at where they are now. It can be done. I'd like to throw in one more question if somebody has one. We'll just go over just a little bit since we had a late start. Anyone else? Please, go ahead. Hi, my name is James Norris, and thank you for coming today. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you sit on the search committee at Boise State for their president. Correct. Why isn't that some sort of problem, given that it... it I think it means that you have knowledge of what the State Board of Education is looking for in a president at one of the universities while you're applying for that same position at another university. Well, I suppose that is one way of looking at it. I look at it differently. Um, State Board of Education asked me to serve on that search committee because they, so I've been working for the State Board of Education in one capacity or another for 20 consecutive years. I used to be their lead counsel and I've worked for them. I've been to every single State Board of Education meeting for the last 20 years straight with two exceptions. One time I had strep throat and one time my son was graduating from college at the same day as a board meeting. I've been to every State Board of Education meeting for 20 years. I've earned my stripes with them, however you want to describe it. I've earned their trust and confidence. They asked me to be on the Boise State Presidential Search Committee, specifically knowing that I would not be an applicant for that job, but that they knew and they trusted, because of the relationship I've built with them, that I will do everything I can to pick the best person to be the president, next president of Boise State University, regardless of what job that I hold. That's the trust and confidence I have with the board. But make no mistake, that means nothing 
as to whether the state board will pick me to be the next president here. It doesn't mean that I'm what they're looking for in a president. It doesn't mean it's what you're looking for in a president. But I can tell you that I have enough trust, I have the board's trust and confidence enough that they will put me on a search committee knowing that I'm a candidate here. That's the level of trust and relationship I have with them. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. Thank you all for being here. Um, as a reminder, that if you have any comments uh, about Kevin, uh, we need to hear that from the, you know, for the, uh, the search committee and the State Board of Education who makes the final decision. Please go onto that website that, that was given, and uh, let's, see, let's hear your comments. We really need to have that information, because it is going directly there. All right, thank you so much. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. What's up, Shelly? I know. Pretty good, brother.